All right, looks like we are live. Everybody, welcome to Standing for Truth. I am your host, SFT. And this afternoon, we have an awesome, awesome show for everybody. We've got Steph back here with us, as well as, of course, our award-winning co-host, George Bond. And we are going to be addressing a video, uh, some arguments in this in this video, a presentation that was done by Dr. Kevin Hankey on the Castile Formation. So we've got a fantastic presentation for everybody today. And as always, we're going to make it interactive. So if you guys do have some questions in the in the live chat, please tag myself or George because after the presentation, we'll have some time for, for some questions. So that being uh, said, Steph, you have been here on the show many times, but it has been a few months since you, you were here last. So Steph, I wanna give you the floor for a brief introduction. How have you been? And uh, I know we've had a, a few shows in the past with you that I would highly recommend people check out. So Steph, thanks for being with us. How have you been? And I know we've had a few shows in the past, with you that I would highly recommend. Right, standing. Yeah. Could I, su I suggest, uh, Steph, uh, can you mute your YouTube because there's an echo? Oh, is it from my. Uh, uh, it might be. You, go to your YouTube screen and mute it. Yeah, Steph, just make sure that you're. Um, if you have another window open with the YouTube video going, just make sure it's muted. And then that way we won't uh, how hear. How am I going to mute if, it? If, if you put your cursor over the YouTube screen, you, oh, you'll, yeah. see, you'll see the um, audio yeah. there. Just click on the audio. It'll go yes. mute. Yeah. yeah. Brilliant. Thanks, uh, George. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> it was horrible with the, the noise. <laughs> yeah, we're all right now. As long as you can hear us good now, Steph, I wanted to yeah. give you the floor, brother, just for a brief introduction. Uh, it has been uh, several months since you were here last. So for anybody new to the channel or they have not yet seen your, your past presentation, Steph, if you wanted to give a little bit about yourself and how have you been? Yeah, well, thank you very much uh, for this opportunity, uh, uh, Donnie. As, uh, well, I've done research on salt formations uh, nearly 15 years now. And, uh, well, this Castile formation has been uh, thrown in my face many times by people. So I'm, uh, I'm really looking forward to explain the origin of this formation to you all. And uh, it's very interesting. It shows a lot of the, the flood uh, geology. Uh, and everything what had to do with the flood. Oh, I appreciate that, Steph. I'm excited for this. Uh, George, before we get into the actual presentation, brother, did you have any any words of introduction? Uh, yes. Um, may the Spirit of God open your eyes to the light, your ears to the truth, and your heart to his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's been a while since we've had you here, Steph. It's nice to see you again. Thank and uh, I'm looking forward to this because I must admit, I watched that uh, stream where Dr. Hankey was introducing his uh, Castile formation, and I've never heard of it before. Mm -hmm. I, I had I had uh, um, a hard time trying to find something on it, actually. I couldn't find much on it. But when I did, I thought, what's he talking about? Uh, some of that information he sent me was very, very interesting. And, uh, yeah, and, and I'm looking forward to uh, hearing more about it. Yeah, well, me as, me as well, me as well. So that being said, uh, we got the introductions out of the way. Steph, we're going to give you the, uh, the floor, brother. I'm going to share your screen here and uh, you take your time. Take as much time as you need for your for your presentation. Yeah. And please let me know if there are uh, any questions. And um, OK, we will talk about the origin of the Castile Formation and uh, how 418,000 layers of salt solidified from a salt magma within the flood mat. So that's uh, that's quite something, 418,000 layers. And well, that has been fully introduced by uh, Dr. Kevin Henke, which uh, work I uh, want to discuss with you all. Um, and for that, I go to his own uh, website uh, where he said the following. 
The Upper Permian Castile Formation is located in the Delaware Basin of southwestern Texas and southeastern New Mexico, USA. The formation has a maximum thickness of about 640 meters, including the Castile Formation. The Delaware Basin contains sedimentary rocks that are about 7,300 meters thick. The challenge for, oh, well, no, let me, uh, a small break here. Um, this is not exactly uh, right presented in here. What the situation is, uh, the situation is even worse uh, for creationists. The situation here is that um, there are uh, about 7,000 meters of, um, of sediments, flood sediments, delivered over the uh, in layers covering the whole continent. And then on top of the 7,000 meters of flood sediments, there suddenly arises um, a reef on top of it. And that's the Delaware Basin. That is covering, that is surrounding the Delaware Basin. So, how is that possible that you have seven thousands of meters of of mud, flood mud, and then on top of it a huge reef uh, surrounding the Delaware Basin? So, the Delaware Basin starts on top of seven thousands of meters of mud. Now, then the challenge for young Earth creationists is not only to explain one, how all that sediment was supposedly deposited in only about one year by Noah's flood, but, but second, how the sediment formed, three, where it came from, and four, how delicate and often water-soluble salt forms could form in the middle of a flood. Now, I like this challenge, but again, Note that the challenge absolutely is huge bigger. Uh, as he is only talking about the Castile Formation, but on top of the Castile Formation, there's the overlying Salado Formation. And so the thickness of salt can be doubled. And in the wider region, there's an awful lot more salt. <clears throat> so the challenge is huge here. Yeah. And we will. Well, I, I look forward to take it on. To start with one, two, and three, uh, how all of that sediment was supposedly deposited in only about one year by Noah's flood, and how the sediment formed and where it came from. Well, I will go through this very fast because it's not really the, the subject of this presentation, but uh, my answer to that, um, and my answer to, to show why kilometers thick layers of sand, clay, and chalk were deposited upon the continents, because these layers were deposited continent-wide. Um, that is because uh, the waters of the flood came from underneath the continental crust. And that water was highly pressurized. It was highly pressurized fresh water containing sediments from underneath this, this continental uh, crust, containing sediments by liquefaction, which is a mechanism by which uh, sediments can be uh, appear liquid uh, when the, the pressure of the liquid in the pores, if the, when the pressure of the water in the pores of the sediments is exceeding the, the lithostatic pressure, then it will become, uh, it will appear like, like, like a fluid. So all these sediments will flow like a fluid. And partly the sediments are in solution because by a high pressure, uh, calcium carbonate, silicium dioxide and other clay minerals can be uh, dissolved in water. And consider by example, the carbonate composition depth, that's a well-known uh, depth at three and a half kilometers in the, in the ocean, uh, below which calcium carbonate dissolves, totally dissolves in water. So if you have uh, a shell uh, from, a, from, a, well, from, from the beach and you bring it in the ocean and you drop it, 
it will fall down in the water and by the time it reaches three and a half kilometers it will dissolve uh, fully um, so calcium carbonate is not very well uh, soluble in water however below the pressure of three and a half kilometer water level then it's very well uh, uh, soluble in water now if this water from underneath the the continents comes up then the immense pressure from underneath the, the continents decreases in the fountains of the great deep this water comes up and it caused the sediments to be delivered on top of the sediments it's quite an, an, an overturning in uh, like uh, the prophet jonah had to say to nineveh that nineveh would be overturned this is quite what what happened here during the flood uh, what was underneath was deposited on top of it <clears throat> um, now number four how delicate and often water soluble salt fires could form in the middle of a flood now water soluble salts like sodium chloride magnesium chloride and potassium chloride um, cannot have been delivered by the fresh water flood of noah because that's what fresh water is there is no sodium chloride in fresh water uh, so the water couldn't deliver it and it's also because these water soluble salts are water soluble they hardly can chemical chemically uh, chemically uh, precipitate from water um, because they are very well soluble in it so the only way to form delicate farce in the middle of a flood in the middle of flood sediments is by volcanic layered intrusion that's the only way that needs to be considered by geologists to understand the Castile formations where all these these 418 layers of salt uh, are delivered and this is an example this um, this picture is from from wikipedia uh, and this is not a salt uh, this is an example just an example of a of a volcanic layered intrusion this is um, a volcanic that has been intruded in a sedimentary rock but this volume of, of magma was sitting there in the other rock and then started to solidify and then during this solidification process it's, um, it's, it's creating layering and that's the kind of layering we are looking at in the Castile formation I will come back on that but this is just an example how it works and every geologist should know this this is common knowledge <clears throat> there are more similarities uh, i will show some similarities between salt uh, formations and igneous formations um, volcanic formations and there's before the the similarity between salt welts and igneous dikes an igneous dike that is the way where uh, a magma passes and that is quite similar to what we see in salt formations this is a, a salt formation a, a model but but in reality you can find all this in in um, in the geologic uh, record and by the here we see the the primary weld that is where the salt has been passed but it's gone now and what's re over what what's recognized is that there was a primary weld now you can see this these uh, pillars can rise up a squeeze die appear but this pillar can be uh, disappeared and then we'll, then we talk about a secondary weld and when this pillar goes up it can also the the, the magma the salt magma can also go sideways and form an allochtono salt layer in between the sedimentary uh, in between the, the the flood mode 
and but there it can again be pushed away be squeezed out and that's called the tertiary weld this is where the allochthonal salt sheet has been removed now all these in 2018 will this uh, uh, as published that welds may form in igneous environments as melting fades and then is removed often exhibiting remarkable similarity to salt systems so we see this similarity that and that brings me well it helps me to understand that salt probably is a a, a volcanic um, rock instead of sedimentary rock what what uh, geologists uh, say well they say it's an evaporation uh, rock is caused by evaporation of water but i i don't bite it it uh, i think it's it's volcanic and i'm not the only one who has problems with this evaporation process because um well salt formations are not evaporized but solidified magma that has interfingered with flat mud and in 2019 uh, the bureau and some other uh, people uh, they published that evaporation alone cannot explain salt deposits several kilometers thick or deposits of highly soluble evaporates and i agree with that evaporation cannot explain salt deposits it's just not possible and in 2021 so this this year this very year uh, this is very key, to, by the way. Everyone who's interested in this in, in geology, every geologist should check out this um, this publication of uh, De Jong, uh, uh, because it's it, he's attacking fundamental uh, geology here yeah, in this uh, publication. So he writes salt structures have not been produced by cold flow of rock salt, but by hot flow of salt lava, which is the state of matter of salt above 600 degrees Celsius. Salt lava flowing into a fluid with a higher density will produce the rayleigh taylor instability, resulting in pillar and mushroom structures. What are these pillar and mushroom structures? This is the example of it. Here you see it. And they, these pillar and mushroom structures that can be up to 10 kilometers high in the geologic record. Up to 10 kilometers high, it's amazingly. So this, this absolutely needs to be understand, this, this publication. It needs to be understood by every geologist. Now, and all this is in line with my own publication, what I published together with Van Heuchten, in 2080, salt magma and sediments interfingered. So we have salt magma and we have flood sediments and they interfingered. And that's what we see in the, in the um, geologic record. Now, let's now see what, what else Henke did get wrong about this Castile and its five. This is what we are talking about. The Delaware Basin of West Texas and Southeast New Mexico, wherein the Castile Formation is located. So this is the border, New Mexico and, and Texas. Um, so this is the west side of Texas. And here you see the, the Delaware Basin, what is located um, and surrounded. The border is, is made by reefs, buried reefs and exposed reefs. So this is a huge uh, basin. Well, for the salt formation, it's rather small. It's not, not very huge, but, but uh, in fact, it's bigger than my uh, garden. <laughs> so it's quite big. Um, so we have this, this thickness of these layers. I, I addressed it already. The layers underneath are continental wide, seven kilometers thick, so that, that's not really uh, located in the basin that's more located underneath the basin and then the basin starts with these reefs on top of these layers there are reefs surrounding this uh, so suddenly there 
is there a rise of a basin in the middle of a flood? What's going on here? And in that basin, there is a Castile formation formed uh, over, a kilo, over a half kilometer thick. And all this is surrounded by red beds. And what I'm suggesting now, because we are heading towards uh, uh, a primary ignis origin, a volcanic origin, uh, might those reef form a caldera? Now, we'll come back on that. But for now, um, this is like an atoll, an atoll. You know an atoll that's, that's a region that's surrounded by, by reefs, and there are many atolls in the world, uh, in the sea, uh, however, none of these atolls worldwide is producing salt formations. So, why is then is suddenly this atoll has been uh, producing salt formations, why where all the other atolls in the world are not producing salt formations? That's that's something strange here. So, I don't think the evidence. Um, is telling us that this, this evaporation process here is correct. Now, let's look into this, this evolutionistic uh, process. Um, how to produce the laminate, the varve, the layering, uh, that, uh, by the way, requires 0.65% of today's ocean water. Because ocean water holds only 0.021 grams calcium sulfate per liter. And the layers in the Castile are mainly calcium sulfate and calcium carbonate. But calcium sulfate is the biggest one. And Ort has calculated in 2009, and he published that, that it requires 0.65% of today's ocean water. Um, to get all this uh, calcium sulfate in the Castile. Now, their process is that in the basin, water evaporates partly until calcium carbonate and gypsum, that's calcium sulfate with some water in it, has been deposited. And from water, you cannot. Uh, um, deposit anhydride, from water you will always uh, deposit gypsum, which is anhydride with water in it, with crystal water. However, what we find in the, in the basin, in the Castile laminae, here in the Castile laminate, we find anhydride. But the system delivers gypsum, so that's, that's already a difference. Then, if this reef has been formed there and the ocean delivers water through the reef, that's what Henke uh, told in his presentation, the ocean delivers water through the reef, not um, over the reef, but it, it, um, it seeps through the reef. And it goes into this basin where the evaporation starts. Then Calcium carbonate and calcium sulfate will be delivered, but uh, at a certain moment in time, because there is an awful lot more sodium chloride in all this water. And if this process continues, then the, the sodium chloride will be deposited in the Castile laminae as well. Well, there are a few uh, layers of sodium chloride in the Castile laminae, so that, that's correct. However, that's only very minor compared to the calcium sulfate. So, water can hold 359 grams per liter of sodium chloride, and it can only handle 0.021 grams calcium sulfate per liter. And now the calcium sulfate is in the laminae, and the sodium chloride is not in the laminae. So, there's a a contradiction, well, that's solved by geologists with uh, the next step, that this very dense salty water, it's very dense because it's holding 359 grams per liter, 
is seeping back into the ocean through the reef. And so they continue a process where the, the sodium chloride seeps out and the new uh, calcium sulfate and calcium carbonate seeps in. That's their system. Um, now, is there a problem? Because this very dense salt water is having a much higher viscosity. It's very slow to pass through the permeal reef. Um, and also the distance has increased. So it's highly unlikely that the water can easily seep in. However, the more dense water is more viscous. So how will that seep out back to the ocean? That's quite a delicate and it's a very delicate system because um, this miraculous process repeats in 209,000 years to find these couples, these couplets every year one layer of calcium carbonate and one la layer of calcium sulfate and that uh, these couplets together make 418,000 uh, layers of, of salt because all these, these materials are, are called salts. So this miraculous process repeats 209,000 times in 209,000 years and what kind of climate is that on Earth? I've never experienced such a climate in, on Earth here. I see day, uh, day by day the weather is changing. It, it, it's, but here in the Castile Formation, it was 209,000 years, exactly the same every year. So it's very miraculous. And then there is another big problem this reef is supposed to live. However, this very dense salt water is killing the reef. It's terrible, a terrible um, environment for a reef to be there. It would be killed immediately. And another thing, as there is a lot of water to pass through the reef, this is not a little bit of water, this is huge. This is a huge amount of water. That means the reef would be eroded. So sorry for the evolutionist, but this is not a working system. And, and is there any valid reason why 0.65% of all ocean water of the world would end up in the Delaware Basin in an evaporation process? Why is that? I can hardly believe that scientists come to such conclusions. And this, think about it, this is just to understand the Castile Formation. But there is a lot more salt. There is the Salado Formation on top of it. And in the whole wide region around it, there's much more salt. That all has to be understood to, to, from other ocean water. It's, it's, it's amazing. This really is a story. It's unbelievable. So Henke's laminate producing system is also not in line with the evidence. And there are no shells or crabs or other sea life. There's nothing in the in the Castile that, that shows us that there was uh, a sea uh, evaporated. There is no sea life in it. Uh, where crabs are very mobile and, and off, obviously would go over this reef and into the, the basin. Also, the anhydride laminae that, that come to arise in the Castile, in the Castile formation the, over there, is a layering, uh, a layering of, of, of uh, calcium sulfate and calcium carbonate. And these layers are impermeable. That's typical for salt formations. Salt formations don't allow water to pass. Now, if that's impermeable and it is uh, deposited against the Capitan limestone here in this cross section, which is the reef, that's the border of the Delaware basin. So here you have the reef 
there you have the castile covering it. How will the water pass through these impermeable uh, layers of the castile through the limestone? And it's even worse. It really is worse here in this cross section. Look here on the date. This is the age. Here you see how old it is. And this is Guadalupian, the Bell Canyon, the Cherry Canyon uh, material, the Capitan limestone, but also the Tensil. That's all Guadalupian from Guadalupian age. This is older than the Ochoan age. Now, this is their dating system. It is not necessarily my dating system, but this is the evolutionist dating system. And what we see is that the reflux, uh, because the Tansil is older than the Castile, that means that the reflux has to go upwards. How is that possible? So that we have very dense salt water that has to go upwards to go out again. But it's so that, that, that's not in line with, with evidence. It's impossible. Well, and note here in this cross section, here you see the Salado. The Salado formation is a, a mainly pure um, sodium chloride, mostly sodium chloride. And you see, notice, it goes wide over the border of the Delaware Basin. So there is a lot more salt involved in here. And even the Castel itself, passes over the Capitan limestone, the, what's called the reef. Now about this, this um, calcium sulfate, the anhydride, which is called anhydride. Um, Henke says that the gypsum vars were deposited out of water and transformed into calcium sulfate by the pressure. So this gypsum is containing crystal water but what we find in the Castile is dry, anhydride, uh, which is gypsum without water. So the crystal water is gone. So, but transforming gypsum with crystal water into anhydride without crystal water, that causes a total volume increase of 10%. So if you have one mole gypsum, and you pressure it by an overburden, which are the upper layers or every layer on top of the Castile. When you pressure it by the overburden, then Henke says it will change to one mole calcium sulfate and two mole water. Well, that's great. However, this volume is 10% higher than the origin. So, pressurizing causing a volume increase? How is that possible? And again, in here, there is no way for the water to escape the impermeable laminae. Because calcium sulfate is impermeable for water. It doesn't go through it. So if this happens, then all this water should, in, should uh, be in existence in this Castile formation, but it's not there, it's a dry formation. Like all other salt formations, this formation is too dry to have been formed from water. So, no, this formation is not being formed by water. It's not even very unique as well, because anhydride vibes uh, are in uh, the European uh, Zechstein salt as well. And I took this from a core from several kilometers uh, uh, in the in the subsurface. Um, so, well, I think these fires confirm a, a volcanic origin. Yeah, by example, the presence of sulfide minerals, sulfide is typical for volcanics. It indicates a volcanic origin. And for, by example, uh, in 2008, Mr. Luer um, presented a paper about primary English anhydride. Its progress since its recognition in the 1982, uh, well, uh, volcanic eruption. So in 1982, there was a volcanic eruption. In there, primary English anhydride has been recognized. 
And since then, geologists have to rethink anhydride because whenever a geologist sees anhydride in the record, he will say it's an evaporation process. It comes from evaporation. However, that's not fully true. It's quite common that it comes from a volcanic eruption. Now, we also have some organic matter. In the organic matter have been reported in the calcium carbonate uh, layers in the in the Castile. And I think that the presence of some organic matter that is just an indication, an indication of the interaction between flat mud and salt magma, because the flat mud um, contained loads of organic matter and the salt magma changed it, transformed it, that, that organics into uh, fossil fuels like gas and oil. So this, these uh, materials are very mobile and in the interaction between the flat mud and the salt magma, it can find its way into the magma. That's not, not very uh, impossible. So now about more about these, um, uh, well, these salt magmas. Maybe, well, geologists are not aware of this at all. They have never heard about an ionic solid or an ionic liquid. They have no idea what it is. But this is what it is. Salt formations are ionic solids. They crystallized out of molten ionic liquids. And sadly, geologists don't have a clue about ionic liquids, as they are poorly educated at the university. They simply don't know about it. But I will explain it to them. An ionic liquid is a salt magma, which is a dry, hot, molten mixture of ions. And you can put in whatever ion you, you want to. It's unlimited what you can put in it. But in this case, it's, well, sodium chloride, of course, and potassium and, and magnesium and uh, calcium and well, all, all the other uh, ions. And from this ionic solid, or from this ionic liquid, you can form halide, sodium chloride, anhydride, calcium sulfate, and carbonate, calcium carbonate. Um, dolomite, which is calcium magnesium carbonate, and you can form magnesium chloride and sulfite, and cetera, and cetera. And if there is some trapped water in it, which is always the case, uh, nowhere on earth there is uh, a volcanic eruption without water in it. There is always water in any. Uh, volcanic system and also in this case because we know it was in interfering with the flood uh, there was certainly some trapped water in it it will end up in it uh, as crystal water uh, by example uh, polyhalide uh, which has some uh, crystal water in it and uh, the hexadride of magnesium chloride hexadride means uh, that there are six water molecules in every magnesium chloride. So that's that's a very watery crystal, but still a solid. Now, Henke mentioned decomposition. And that's, that's uh, yeah, he is right in that. That, that is something you, you need to understand, but he's wrong in, in a way. In a way, he's right to mention it. In another way, he's wrong. Um, the point with this ionic liquids is that um, the, the, the melting temperature of the liquid will decrease, will go down by the more chemicals you will put in it. So, well, let's, I will, I will just read this, this presentation, uh, I think so. So, what is decomposition? What's the problem? Let's understand that first. Um, at elevated temperatures, far above 600 degrees Celsius, calcium sulfate and calcium carbonate will decompose into solid calcium oxide, which is not a salt anymore. This is not a salt, this is just an oxide. Plus the gases 
sulfur, uh, sulfur oxide and carbon dioxide. So that's an atmospheric pressure. And I experienced this myself with melting tests. I've done many melting tests to understand these ionic liquids. And this is what happened when you uh, do tests at atmospheric pressure. So when you think, I, I thought to be melting salts, but I ended up with uh, calcium oxides and with uh, very poisonous gases. So it was not, uh, my tests were not, not very nice to be. <laughs> um, however, so, so the problem is real. The problem what, what Henke uh, mentioned. However, under flood conditions, decomposition will be prevented by one, the pressure of the flood water, because on top of all this uh, uh, salt, the salt was intruded into the sediments of the of the flood and above the sediments there still was an amount of water a level of water and one kilometer level of water will deliver 100 bar and another important thing is the low temperature of the magma because you can say well calcium sulfur has a melting point of 1460 degrees celsius which is sky high uh, however if you combine that with uh, sodium chloride, which has um, a melting temperature at 800 degrees Celsius, if you combine these two uh, salts in one ionic liquid, then the melting temperature decreases to 700 degrees already. And when you put in other chemicals, then the temperature, the melting temperature will go down and down and down by the way, by, by example, uh, the old Daniolenge falcon, which is a salt falcon in, in, um, in Africa, it has a magma with, it delivers a magma every day at a temperature of about 500 degrees Celsius at that low. So the temperature is not necessarily creating uh, decomposing as well. So, Enki was right in, in this again, but that's because geologists don't understand uh, ionic liquids. They don't know what it is. <clears throat> then, the solidification of ionic liquids. That is a very, very interesting thing as well. I can uh, I will not go deep into this. If you want to know more, uh, the simplest way to get some information about uh, ionic liquids is a tactic system in the Wikipedia. It gives you an overview um, about the behavior of uh, the solidification process processes in 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 well molten material. Now. A, version A, because we have four versions in which the, the solidification can, can, can work out. And A is the most common, is the most common lamellar solidification like um, in the Castile and in most salt formations. This is what we find in most salt formations, a lamellar um, uh, a layering of, of very... Uh, lamels on top of each other and that's exactly what i showed before in the volcanic um, layered intrusion uh, this is what we see in volcanic intrusions and this is what is showed up in ionic liquids as well when it solidifies so that's very much in line with what we find in the castile formation it's just the most common solidification process from ionic liquids. So that answers all the questions, I would say. Now, there is more to say because you can also have A, B, C, or D. And I have an example, what I think, because I have not thoroughly uh, researched it, but in, in these states, I would say, well, it's quite like 
likely that C is, uh, is a globular solidification. And I think the white sands, which is a nearby formation, uh, nearby the, the Castile formation, uh, is an example of that. That is where anhydride solidified here in, in uh, a soluble salt matrix. And all these, these uh, globulars, that is the anhydride and the matrix material that is from a very soluble salt. Anhydride is not very much soluble. So, and then since the flood, because it has been delivered in the flood, but since the flood, the matrix salt dissolved and was washed out. And the anhydride then remained and transformed into gypsum by the overload of water. And then, so all the water found its way into the crystal uh, of the anhydride and then it transformed into gypsum. So that's my idea about it. Now, Kevin said that there is no other salt in the area. However, there is an abundant amount of salt. Oh, by the way, this is the white sand. So that's here you see uh, the Delaware Basin, the Midland Basin, the Palo Duro Basin, the Valverde Basin. These are all salt formations. And here is just the white sand where we, this, this globular, no, how was the word? Like, the globular solidification took place. Um, and all this is part of the Permian Salt Basin, which goes over Kansas, Oklahoma, Texas, and New Mexico. It's huge. So the Castile in the Delaware Basin is just a feature at the south edge of the Permian Salt Basin. And I think what we see here is a series of salt falcons. falcons. Here in the Palo Duro Basin, here somewhere in the Midland Basin, probably in the Horseshoe Atoll. Here's the Horseshoe Alt Atoll in the middle of of the Midland Basin, and here in the Delaware Basin, and underneath the White Sand, a small falcon eruption as well. So, and the heat of all this salt, because the whole area is, uh, well, the Salado formation, by example, is uh, going over the borders of the Delaware Basin. So there is a lot more salt than, than, than here. This is a huge salt formation. It's about 220,000 square kilometers, which is absolutely stunning. And the heat of all this salt caused fossil fuels in the mud. Remember, underneath all this, there is seven kilometers of flat sediments, flat mud with organic material in it. So when there is a pancake of salt flowing over it with a high temperature, then this temperature will cause the organics to change into fossil fuels. And that's exactly what we find here. There is an awful lot of uh, oil and gas winning in this area. Now, what will happen if you pour, when you pour molten salt into water? Molten salt, uh, to melt salt, you uh, need to put a lot of heat in it. And when it comes out, in, 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 when it finds its way into water, then you will see an explosion. The backyard scientist showed that he, he poured some molten salt into an aquarium, a fish tank, and it exploded immediately. It was, everyone was shocked. Nice video on YouTube. And that's just because water uh, will explode when it faces a uh, temperature. In his case, he put uh, five of 800 degrees Celsius uh, salt in it because that's the melting temperature of sodium chloride. Um, I think our conditions are at a lower temperature, but still, when you bring in an awful lot of heat, um, in water, then the water will explode. Every volume of water will explode to a, a thousand times bigger volume. So I think this explosion of uh, 
these fish tanks of, of the backyard scientist, this explosion helps us to understand what happened when this salt erupted into the flood knot. And the explosion explains the caldera-like reefs that surrounding this kind of, of salt formations. Uh, salt formations usually are surrounded by carbonate platforms. And the Delaware and also the European Zechstein are examples of this. Geologists call them reefs, which I think is a false interpretation of their origin. Because these are calderas caused by the explosion. So these carbonate platforms are constructed primarily from lime-rich mud with calcareous sponges and crusting algae and stromatolites. And this is just what can be expected to exist in the upper layer of the flood mud. In the upper layer of the flood mud, there you would expect some life, some sea life to arise there. And now, the explosive power of the hot salt, when that's injected, erupted, and protruding all these layers and comes on, on top of it, where the pressure is lower, then this hot salt, uh, the, the water explodes. And this hot salt will push all this matter on top of the layers, the side by which a caldera-like structure will remain, will be formed. And then the lower part of the magma became contaminated uh, with, with the organics in it, uh, which is reflected in the Castile Laminae. Now, there's another feature, I addressed it already, is salt magma causing red rocks. As the muddy water of the flood erupted out of the Great Deep during 150 days, there was mud from underneath the continents, it was deposited upon the continents, and then salt magma erupted and interfingered with this mud until late in the flood year. And what happens then with all this, this heat is erupted, is, is delivered into clay and sand, then like brick factories, in brick factories there is clay transformed into red bricks. Now, the heat of the magma did exactly the same. And I've well, there are many examples of it. Every salt formation is surrounded by red rocks, uh, uh, like the red sandstone underlying the 500,000 square kilometer Zechstein salt formation in Europe. That's called the road ligand. That's a red rock. And there's also on top of the Zechstein salt, there's the red clay stone. That's the Boon sandstone. And here in the, the east of the Netherlands, we have a salt formation, a salt pillar rising up through the layers and uh, the Sechstein salt. And then this, this, this pillar rises up a kilometer or one or two. And then it goes, flows sideways into these layers of the flood, the, the, the mud layers, uh, which are now called Triassic and split them in a lower Triassic and an upper middle an upper and middle uh, Triassic. Now, these layers have been made red, baked by the heat of the salt. And a month ago, I attended a drilling uh, in the east of the Netherlands, and at 150 meter depth, uh, we found the red baked Triassic claystone. So, it's just, it all comes together, it, it fits in each other. And well, looking back at all this uh, and the presentation of uh, Kevin Henke, uh, I would say, well, now this is what happens when evolutionists propose a model. This is very typical. Uh, when you look into it at any detail, it just falls apart. It's bullshit. Uh, however, despite I want to thank Kevin Henke for showing that water-based hydrothermal and supersaturated uh, brine models are false. I have not addressed it yet, but uh, Kevin made a, a good point here when he says, uh, if you have a flood and 
you then get some eruptions of hydrothermal, so it's hot water uh, and, and super saturated uh, brine, uh, hot water brine, so, so super saturated brine, and you erupt that into the hot water or in, in the flood water, then you will not end up with a salt formation. So he's right on that point. And I must say there are many uh, young earth creationists holding clinging to uh, hydrothermal and supersaturated brine models, but these models are false. So he's right on that. Um, and I must say these incorrect models hinder the true volcanic explanation, what I'm uh, explaining to people. So now, um, if you want to know more on salt, because I have loads, loads more to tell about it, well, check it out on YouTube, you will find my work. Uh, uh, many locations, well, at Standing for Truth, I have been uh, presenting before. You can find my own uh, work on YouTube, uh, whatever. If you have any questions, then please let me know. Uh, this was my presentation. It was, well, really uh, less than an hour. Not too bad, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I got to say, uh, Steph, that was a... A fantastic presentation. Everybody in the chat, for the most part, agrees this is uh, this deserves a rewatch. Wow, thank re you. Watches, so I'll definitely be rewatching it just to uh, just to gather and understand the uh, amazing data that that you've presented. Uh, so much good information. Uh, we we definitely do have some questions, Steph. And okay. uh, I'm I'm shocked that an hour has already flown by. That was uh, that was really great stuff. Um, I want to I want to say this team, you know, Team Standing for Truth, we're we're really blessed to have uh, wonderful minds like yourself, Steph, and Thanks. Professor David McQueen, for example, as as part of our team, because you guys help us out so greatly, and uh, I just I really appreciate it, brother. Well. And and that being said, George, I'm going to give you the floor because I think you might want to ask the first question. But before you ask the first question, you may have some comments you wanted to make about the presentation, George. So go ahead, brother. Well, I definitely agree with what you said, uh, Standing. I think it was an excellent presentation. I'll certainly be um, watching it again because there's a, a few things that I probably missed. But uh, one of the comments that I want to make is... Um, and it's, and it's not so much a criticism of uh, geologists, but they have to understand it's not just geology that plays a part in all of this. Uh, I mean, we've shown with the limestone formation, for example, so many years of assumptions that macritic organisms were responsible for the formation of limestone. That's been turned in, in, on its head because we know now that's also a chemical process. Yeah, and and Steph introduced a number of other arguments here with the Castile Formation, which suggest there's more than just geology that uh, plays a part in this. There's also a lot of chemistry, and pro probably probably there's a lot of physics as well, or or maybe a number of other science disciplines. But one of the things, Steph, that we've been doing over the last month or so, we've been looking at the heat problem because uh, some People like Dr. Henke, who are critics of young earth creationism, have sort of united with the atheists to defeat the young earth pos creation position. And we looked at a number of uh, solutions to this heat problem through the absorption of um, the heat through the mantle and the crust, as well as the water. But I'm just wondering, I, I really didn't, con I didn't consider salt in that uh, particular sort of calculation because I was, an, I was unable to find an accurate uh, number as to how much salt there is on the earth. A, a number of um, websites I read, they vary considerably. Do you have an idea of how much salt is actually in the earth? Not just the oceans, but in the earth. Oh, <laughs> that's very difficult. Uh, geologists are not very clear on it. It's not easy to uh, to make an estimate on that because uh, salt formations are very um, 
grilly how, how do we say that the form is nowhere the same it's it's always uh, jumping up in these huge pillars and then squeezed away and then uh, 100 kilometers farther away there in the, there is a layer again it's 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 a big mess with this uh, formation but i i have i must say i found so let me but well, forget. I, I have a book. I, I can send you uh, an overview on it. I, I have seen it. If if I trust it, I don't know. But but I have seen an overview of salt formations. And um, anyway, the biggest one is uh, nearby the Castile, uh, south of the Castile. That is the underneath the the Gulf of Mexico. That's the biggest salt formation on earth. Uh, but but there is a, I have seen a list with some estimates about how how tall they are. Yeah, it'd be interesting to do the exercise because looking at salt, I think the specific heat of um, of salt is around eight eighty joules, uh, which sort of puts it on par with basalt and granite. So, but it's interesting yeah. to find out the quantity of salt so you can actually determine how much heat it actually could absorb because I think you you said somewhere in the in that presentation it's around 600 degrees centigrade is that yeah. correct no I've, I've made a calculation once and I came to the to the conclusion that uh, one cubic kilometer of salt is able to evaporate one cubic kilometer of water whoa okay thank you so all right but it's very much depending on uh, what temperature you start with and, and end up with. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, it's, it's very fake. <laughs> yeah. But it gives an impression. Well, well we've got a question here um, from the audience pertaining to the presentation, Steph. I've put it up on screen uh, so we can all see it and read it. So the question's from Luca. Luca, I appreciate the question. For Steph. So he asks, the Zechstein formation is proposed to be composed from seven layers deposited at different times. Steph, what is your opinion or, or your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, now he's, uh, uh, Luca is digging in, in, in what I am researching. Uh, I've done tests. I try to understand ionic liquids, the solidification process, and my test failed because I was in atmospheric uh, conditions and my tooling was not, uh, couldn't cope with the corrosive uh, character. I used an oven of my brother and this oven is, uh, is, uh, was dead at the end of my experiments. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm very glad that my my brother helped me. However, he lost his oven with my experiments. Um, uh, but this is one of the questions I would uh, like to answer. My first impression of these seven uh, layers that have been uh, identified by, by uh, geologists is that there were seven individuals, individual uh, eruptions, major eruptions, and major with major I mean major, uh, real major. Uh, the the the, the Zechstein formation is a deposit of five hundred thousand cubic kilometers of salt. That's unbelievable. So, if there were seven major eruptions, then okay, that that's probably the answer to this question. However, I'm not sure. I haven't done my tests properly. Um, maybe there is another system. I don't know. I, I noticed this um, uh, ionic liquids are very complicated. They act on pressure. They act on temperature. Uh, they act on the ion, the, 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 the cations, uh, the one with, with a covalentian, is that the word? Covalentian of two plus or two min, and the covalence of one plus and one min, they might separate. So a ionic liquid can be, can flow in several uh, layers. 
it can uh, uh, how do you say the precipitate in several layers by density. Um, so it's not necessarily that everything has been mixed very nicely. Uh, so it's possible that that it was one major um, eruption where after several uh, layers did come to arise within the within the liquid so that every liquid has its own conditions wherein it solidified later on uh, that's all possible so it's, it's very complicated uh, and as long as geologists don't study uh, ionic liquids then well, we shouldn't jump to conclusions about the solidification processes. Sorry. No, that's a great question and a great response, Steph. I, I always appreciate how informative you are. So here's a question that comes in from Doki Doki Bible Club. I appreciate the question, brother. At SFT, which makes more sense, clean or salty ocean at the start? I don't understand the question. Um clean or I salty i, I guess uh, uh, fresh water or, or or salt water at the start of creation is, is that what it would be george or what are your thoughts on it i i think what doki is trying to um imply there is um there's talks you know like you read about the the amount of salt that's actually deposited in the oceans today mm -hmm. and if if the earth was 4.5 billion years you know, wouldn't the uh, oceans be too salty for, for life to exist? I think that's that's what Doki's trying to say. So which way, she say, uh, sorry, he's saying, which makes more sense, clean or salty ocean at the start? Yeah, well, um, evolutionists do have a problem with the salt uh, amount in the sea, in the oceans, because it's getting saltier year by year, and... If you calculate it back, then the ocean can be uh, only about 50 million years old. So that doesn't really fit in uh, their billions of years old. So, <laughs> yeah. so evolutionists do have a problem with that. Uh, from a creationist point of view, uh, I've come to the conclusion that God created the earth with uh, fresh water and that's reasonable because a paradise had to uh, to start on it and everybody everything was covered by water and then God created these continents and created paradise now everything say that everything was covered by salt water then it's a bit strange uh, to start a paradise from that and also the the flood the flood was uh, delivered by water from what got uh, stored underneath the continents in the creation week and from this water underneath the continents the paradise was uh, flowered was was the streams out of the paradise that was that water came from underneath the continents. So this water underneath the continents was fresh water. It was able to, to drain the paradise. And when this erupted in one time, in this, this 150 days during the flood, then this was fresh water that uh, came out of the earth. Also, the rain was fresh water, of course. So the flood was a fresh water flood. And since the flood, uh, when all these, these eruptions of salt solidified in the flood mud, since then, the sea and the oceans are becoming saltier and saltier and saltier day by day. I appreciate that answer, uh, Steph. I also appreciate the question, Doki Doki. So here's the next question uh, for you, Steph. So the question is, did Dr. Hankey, Kevin Hankey, present anything that you found even mildly strong in terms of argumentation against a global flood? Uh, yeah. Uh, 
uh, I would say everything uh, what he said was was is he, he can only look to salt as being evaporated, uh, the result of the evaporation process, and that's such that's blinding him. So he comes to totally wrong conclusions, and the process he describes to to. Uh, to prepare this this 418 layers in the in the Castile is outrageous. It has nothing to do with science, but it has to do with uh, writing fairy tales and preparing fairy tales. It is, is nothing. There is no reality in his story. And uh, no, I'm, I'm not. Uh, but I, I think all geologists all over the world they they need to reconsider their thoughts on salt and it's 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 also a biblical thing um, that the salt of the earth is spiritual is is important we are the salt of the earth and this is but this is the physical salt of the earth and this is also cleaning up the ideas of geologists so there is some some parallelism in this uh, this thing <laughs> yeah well I, I appreciate that step this is a question that just came in pertaining to the salt magma origin um, i want to let people know that i have uh, put your your resources your previous presentations in the description box as well as your uh articles <laughs> in the journal of creation uh, oh great check out so this is a question from John B. I appreciate the question, John. Uh, he asks, at Standing for Truth, how does one conjecture a salt magma origin that is precluded entirely by geochemical data and expect to be taken seriously? And he's got a couple papers uh, listed. What are your thoughts overall on that? Uh, yeah. step? I need uh, a translator uh, for this. This is too difficult for my English. <laughs> Sorry. Can you explain the question? What? What? Conjecture? What? 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 I don't know. If um, if John B in the chat wanted to maybe reiterate the question for Steph, then we can uh, then we can present it again. Um, but I think this question is important too, Steph, and then we'll get back to John's question if you wanted to kind of reiterate the the objection. Um, yeah. Because I wanted to point, I, I wanted to get to this question as it pertains to your presentation. So the question, Steph, is on one slide you pointed out that Kevin said that there is no other salt in the area, but indeed there is an abundant amount of salt, you pointed out in your slide. Can you expand on this? And are critics of the YEC model not always up to date or fully informed when they criticize? Well, I think uh, maybe I shouldn't have mentioned it. I think it was a slip of the tongue of uh, Kevin because he will uh, fully agree with me that there is a lot more salt in the, in the area. So, yeah, maybe I should have left it out. I, I think it's just uh, it was a slip of the tongue of him. <laughs> <laughs> No problem, no problem. So um, John B. says that his question was, uh, it'd be difficult to put into one one comment because unfortunately these, these comments are limited, I think, to 200 letters. But he points out here, uh, I don't know if this helps uh, explain it a little bit more. He, he says, fluid inclusion analyses constrain the formation temperature of Castile evaporates. I don't know if that yeah. helps. Yeah, I like this the fluid inclusions. Yeah, that's that's nice. Um, this is typical. Uh, the the logic of geology. So there is a fluid inclusion in salt. Okay, there are fluid inclusions, uh, normally quite small, and you can analyze what if this water. So you have a, a little amount of water in a dry salt formation and there's sitting one, one drop of water in it. And then you check, you analyze what's in this 
droplet of water. And you find, well, of course, what will you find in a droplet of, so of water inside a salt formation? Well, you will find salt in this droplet. So you will find sodium, calcium, uh, potassium, silver, and whatever uh, these other things are. You will find them there. No problem. What was the point? And then they calculate somehow that there was a formation temperature of the castal evaporates to uh, 25 to 45 degrees, a window of 25 to 45 degrees Celsius. And you can plot a long seawater brine evolution line. You, you can plot whatever you want. It's just a droplet of water, what has been catched in this magma. And now this water, uh, obviously, because water likes salts, so and the, the, the salts like the water, so this droplet of water will contain sodium, calcium, and, and coma on. Everything was there is in the water as well. So I, I really don't see how they can make a case that it plots something about how the the Castile came to arise. It, it, it just doesn't doesn't match. Well, I appreciate that, uh, Steph. Um, let me go to the next question here, and then George, I'll let you um, pick which one you might want to ask next because we've had um, you on for a presentation. This is one of your uh, articles in the Journal of Creation: A Magnetic Model for the Origin of Large salt formations and the question is especially for a lot of new people to the to the channel uh, the question Steph is why does the magnetic model explain the characteristics of the salt deposits better than alternative models such as those put forth by deep time uniformitarians in brackets evaporation model yeah I have to repeat my presentation thing. So. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, uh, yeah, I, I would definitely say uh, check out uh, Steph's presentation with us and then uh, also read his his article in the Journal of Creation. I guess if you were, let's say you were stuck in an elevator for, for one minute with, with, with somebody, Steph, and you, know, you had a minute to kind of show them this amazing evidence and, and why this model is stronger, how would you uh, explain it to them, I guess, in, in a nutshell, in a, in a real quick way where, where they can maybe understand it? Well, in a nutshell, uh, look at the size. Uh, you have 500,000 cubic kilometers of salt in one formation. How did that come to arise? Well, obviously by uh, a volcanic eruption. That's a primary igneous rock, just like a, a basalt formation. Uh, it's that simple. There is no other way to explain this. It, uh, evaporation requires to, when you want to, uh, uh, to end up with one kilometer of, of salt, a layer of one kilometer of salt, you have to evaporate 60 kilometers of seawater, of ocean water. That's ridiculous. That's not a model, that's a fairy tale. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. And we that's hear good. a lot of those. And then, and your other article that, that I highly recommend people check out, clarifying, so I put it up on screen here, clarifying the uh, your, your specific model for the origin of salt deposits, answering criticism. So this one was a, was a ton of fun to read. I think you did a fantastic job, Steph, answering the, answering the critics in this article, a very specific critic. So the question is, have you seen any, uh, any, any real good rebuttals from the critics pertaining to the data found in your article and in your model that helps confirm the biblical time scale? Uh, sorry, I, are you asking for a good critic? I have one good critic that I would like to, to address. There is sure. one uh, difficult critic, um, and you put it in writing and you put it in the paper, that is that the surrounding material, the surrounding uh, sand and clay layers are not affected by the heat of the salt. That's uh, put in my face many times now and that there is a kind of logic in it, in it and say that I pour a salt magma 
in my backyard, in my own backyard, and I pour it over the ground, then I will find that this heat of the magma will have affected the salt of the, the, the sand and, and the, the clay and whatever there is in my garden, it will be affected by the heat. And, and geologists can recognize that. They can recognize, hey, there's something uh, passed here with a lot of heat. And now geologists say against my model that the salt formations are not surrounded by sediments that are affected by the heat. And they are wrong for several reasons. The first thing is that they are all red baked. So they are affected by the heat. That's one. So the observation is they are indeed, they are affected by the heat because they are red baked. And then secondly, there is another thing that are not affected by that much, that high temperature, what they would expect. They think, okay, you have a salt, from a salt magma with a temperature of at least 500 degrees Celsius running over a layer of sand of, or clay or whatever. So we will see evidence of this temperature 500 degrees in the sand and the clay underneath it and on top of it. We will see that. And there they are wrong. They are terribly wrong here because this is delivered within a watery flood, within a watery mud layer. So there is not a solid layer of clay or, or sand underneath it, and the salt is running over a solid layer of, 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 of other material. No, the salt is intruding into mud, uh, which means there is an overload of water. And the effect of water at salt is explosion. So the salt layer is running over, it is carried by a layer of steam. There is a layer of steam which is surrounding the, the salt. So the salt never reaches, touches the ground underneath it. It doesn't touch the, the mud, the grains in it. There's always this layer of steam, what is making a distance between the high temperature of the salt and the temperature in the mud. And this layer of steam is limited in temperature uh, because steam just is 100 degrees Celsius in atmospheric pressure. And if you have a 200 bar on it, then this temperature is well, whatever it is at 200 degrees Celsius, uh, oh, oh, sorry, at 200 uh, bars, then the temperature can go up. But there is always a distance between the temperature in the magma, the layer of steam, what is carrying the magma, and the mud underneath it. So that's what, where they, uh, the critics fail. And they just don't want to understand this. So it's coming back and again and again and again. But their story, they, they, they don't want to understand the, the reality of flood science. Amen. Well said, well said. And, and I think um, you've done a great job responding to the critics, uh, staff. But I've, I've noticed that when you address their criticisms or refute their criticisms, they instead of, you know, tap out and I guess admit the feet, they, they kind of just keep repeating those arguments and talking points. So great job. Uh, George, I'm going to hand it to you, brother. We're going to start winding down here because we're coming at the hour and a half mark. And uh, I, I thought maybe there's a final couple questions you wanted to ask. I've been asking most of them. So I'm going to give you the floor, George. We'll start winding down here. And uh, there's the last couple questions. Go ahead. Oh, thank you. Uh, look, one of the first things that uh, I actually picked up from the uh, from the presentation on the Gutsy Gibbon channel. Uh, Dr. Henke literally threw um, Lyle under the bus before he even started talking about uh, his presentation. Uh, the 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 evolutionists uh, thinking of the present is the key to the past effectively died when he said that. He, he literally accepted uh, catastrophic uh, processes. 
but now and then you'll find that they revert back to the uniformitarian um, issues uh, when it uh, comes to, um, you know, suiting their arguments, uh, e.g. the evaporative salt um, conditions. But but this, this question relates to the, um, you know, is there far too much limestone on the planet to be accounted for by the young earth creationist model? And I, I've actually presented some information here where just recently I read an article where uh, they found uh, huge amounts of carbon dioxide in the Earth's mantle. And recent experiments done by, or not so much experiments, but they were actually testing the, um, the, 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 the idea that if, if they could remove the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and pump it deep into, um, into the Earth, Six to 12 months later, these scientists found that that turned to limestone. So there's plenty of evidence there to suggest that the young earth creation model um, can account for the large amounts of limestone that we find on earth. What are your, what are your sort of views on that, uh, Steph? Yeah, I, probably well, answer, I probably answered the question for you, but I just want to know what your, your views are. Yeah, uh, limestone is uh, many ways to many possible ways to to get an origin it, it can be formed by uh, biochemical processes like uh, shells and and oaks they can form uh, calcium carbonate uh, so that's that's from a biological point of view you can also um, get it from uh, volcanics uh, it has a melting point uh, and uh, I, I'm certain that lots of the Alps in, in Europe are from uh, a volcanic origin and not from, from other uh, things. So that's volcanic origin is possible. Uh, it's also possible, and that's, that's the major, I think that the most, the major amount of limestone and, and, uh, and chalk and all that kind of things is delivered by water, the flood water. Because flood water can uh, contain loads of calcium carbonate uh, in solution at a depth below three and a half kilometers. That's the carbonate composition depth, three and a half kilometer depth. And from and that's so when this, this salt water, uh, sorry, when this uh, flood water uh, rose up during the flood, then it precipitated all its uh, lime in it. So it formed limestone and all that, that kind of things. Um, so, and, and, and maybe there are more, but I addressed now three major ways to prepare lime uh, deposits. Yeah. That's a great... Uh... Oh, thank you. That's a great answer, Steph. Great question, uh, George. We've hit the hour and a half mark and uh, time has really flown by, Steph. It is always a privilege and uh, a pleasure to have you on. This was a fantastic presentation. Uh, definitely deserves a rewatch. So much great data and information. So everybody in the chat, please share it around. Uh, this is important information that we want to get out to people. Uh, thank you as well for the, uh, for the super chat, super stickers. In the chat, you guys are the life and blood of this channel. It's why we can put out so much content and do this, uh, the work of God full time. So God bless you. God bless you, Steph and George. Steph, any final words uh, before we shut it down for the night? Yeah, I want to, to address again, uh, please check out my, my YouTube. And if you have any questions, please send me on, the, here is my email address. So let me know what you think. Uh, if you have something, uh, to encourage my work then, uh, or if you, because uh, yeah, there is something I missed, I, I, I should have told uh, also. Um, I think the, the geologists have um, a major omission by not investigating uh, uh, the salt, the, the ionic liquids. And they need to, uh, to get up with budget, with money, to do the tests. These tests are very expensive, uh, as they we need to do tests at very high temperature and very high pressures, 
and in a very corrosive environment. So it's very difficult. It will take a lot of money. But if theologists are prepared to do their work, then they will find out how this layering exactly, exactly works and, and what can be done from an ionic liquid. And it's their omission. It's their duty. They are the geologists. They have to come to take action. They have to raise money for this. And if they need help, uh, I will I will help them with with knowledge because I have done tests. I I'm way ahead of every other geologist on this subject, so I'm ready to help. But I can't finance this all on my own. So they need to to do their work, and I I'm ready to help them. Amen. Well said, Steph. Uh, great final words. I appreciate it again. I appreciate your time. Steph, I know how busy you are, so I, I always appreciate that. George, any final words, uh, my good man? Uh, I'll just add that uh, Steph was uh, kind enough to actually provide um, his email in that presentation. So if you've got questions relating to the presentation, um, Steph, I'm sure will entertain whatever you, you have to say about it, and he, hopefully he'll provide a good answer for you. Yeah, that's okay. Awesome. I appreciate it. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that uh, I think wraps up this program. Again, thanks so much, Steph. Thank you, George. And to the audience, thank you so much as well. God bless everybody. Standing for Truth is out.